Good evening, and thank you for joining the Westerly Library in Wilcox Park for tonight's program with Westerly Land Trust and Friends. This program is being presented using the webinar version of Zoom and attendees are joining in listening mode only. Please send any and all questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer all questions within the time we have allotted. Please note that this program is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel as soon as possible. Should you get disconnected, simply use the link that was emailed to you to get into the program. I will now turn it over to our guest speaker for tonight, Youth Education Community Engagement Coordinator, Joe Barnes. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Amanda. Happy Earth Day, everyone. I'm so glad that you could come out to our Voices of the Land webinar. As Amanda said, my name is Joseph Barnes. I am the Youth Education and Community Engagement Coordinator with the Westerly Land Trust. Um, and so I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. But first, a huge shout out and thank you to Amanda and to the Westerly Library in Wilcox Park for hosting, organizing, and handling all the logistics of this webinar. It was a huge help. So go support your local library. Again, the chat room is open, so feel free to talk amongst yourselves in there. If you uh, want to, feel free to introduce yourselves and say where you're Zooming in from. The Q&A box is also open, so if you have any questions, we will have a Q&A section towards the end. So I like your questions. We're looking forward to them. And I will get started with a little bit of background with about the Westerly Land Trust. So in Westerly, we have 31 properties conserved, and that's about 1,700 acres with 25 miles of hiking trails just in Westerly, Rhode Island. Our mission is to conserve open space, revitalize culturally significant properties, and provide environmental programs for the enduring benefit of our community. So what does that mean exactly? For conserving open space, we do trail maintenance on the hiking trails that we have. We have a very core group of dedicated volunteers that build bridges, that clear away brush or fallen tree limbs, and just keep the preserves accessible to everyone. We also promote land conservation through local agriculture. On our Barlow Nature Preserve, that's the West Land Trust Office Headquarters, we have three farmers. There's Echo Rock Flowers, which is a cut flower garden, um, Vitanova Compost, which does vermicomposting, which is with worms, and Frontier Farm, an herb and vegetable farm owned by Cassidy Whipple, who is one of our panelists tonight. So you'll hear about that later. We preserve scenic views, but not only do we preserve scenic views, we preserve the ecological benefits behind those views. So to the left is a vernal pool at the Dr. John Chamblin Glacier Park. And vernal pools are critical for a lot of amphibian species, as well as provide habitat for bugs, plants, birds. They just support a lot of biodiversity. The top right is river wood, which is a forest. So it has, uh, along the trails there, a lot of uh, mountain laurel and it's just a nice place to be. And then the bottom right is Winnipeg Farm Preserve, which has conserved land on the coast of a salt marsh in Westerly. And so again, very important ecosystem. Many animals specific to salt marshes live there. So it's just, it's great that we have that land. Embracing culturally significant properties. We do this with our urban initiative, which is very unique for a land trust, um, but the reason we conserve buildings downtown is to keep a vibrant and bustling downtown scene to keep development pressure off of the land outside downtown. So we have the Industrial Trust Building, which is an old bank. The United Theater is currently undergoing renovations, and that's what it will look like. And then we have the ice rink, which we convert into our farmer's market during the summer. And we have a green space downtown, such as our community garden. On many of our preserves are historic cemeteries as well. On the left is the Quaker Burial Ground, which is the site of the first Quaker Meeting House in Westerly. And then the Clark Hiscox grave on the right is on Grills Preserve, and it dates back to the Revolutionary War. For environmental programming, I my role is for uh, living laboratories and youth education, where I bring students out to the preserves and teach them environmental education in an outdoor classroom setting. We also do guided monthly all ages hikes on our preserves where everyone, they learn about the history and the ecology of the preserves as well as just enjoy a nice evening hike. And then community events like our farmer's market and our farm dinner 
um, which we'll have later this summer. So keep an eye out for that. And lastly, this webinar is kind of a, a condensed version of our podcast of the same name, Voices of the Land, which you can find anywhere you stream music or from our website, westerlylandstrust.org. And Voices of the Land comes out each month and we interview and talk with someone who works with the land, just like what we're doing tonight. Um, it's just a way to hear about new perspectives and new ways that people use the land in a sustainable way. So thank you to our panelists. Tonight we have Cassidy Whipple, the owner of Frontier Farm, Mary Gannon, the Wildlife Outreach Coordinator of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management Division of Fish and Wildlife, and Gabby DeMalon, the Outreach Technical Assistant from the Division of Fish and Wildlife, and Dave Prescott, South County Coast Keeper from Save the Bay. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Cassidy. Thanks, Joe. Let me pull up. Frontier Farm slides here. Oops, let's go back. Um, hi everyone, thanks for uh, joining us and happy Earth Day. Um, thanks to Amanda for hosting and for Joe for asking me to be a part of this. I'm excited to be here. Um, so uh, my name is Cassidy Whipple. I own Frontier Farm. The vegetable and herb farm that Joe mentioned is at the um, Barlow Nature Preserve, um, also the Westerly Land Trust headquarters. So I lease land from the Westerly Land Trust. And this is uh, kind of an aerial view of where the farm is. Um, and I like to, I li I liked to add this uh, in relation to Dunn's Corner Road and Westerly Bradford Road, because a lot of folks get confused with this kind of crazy intersection here. So we're right on the corner of that. And the two and a half acres that I lease um, is comprised of this sort of area, odd little shape there. <laughs> um, last year was our first kind of official year growing at uh, Barlow and Sellings. Um, and this year we're gonna scale up from a quarter acre to about a full acre. We sell on the property at a farm stand. We also have a CSA program, which is new this year. And we um, sell at two uh, farmers markets, the Westerly Farmers Market, and this year we will be at the um, Charlestown Land Trust Farmers Market as well. Um, so when I uh, talk about the farm, I like to talk about kind of our four sort of driving principles of the farm, um, which are environmental stewardship, soil health, food accessibility, and community. And these things are something I kind of always think back on when I'm making any kind of decision about the farm. Um, and our farm methods are really kind of a tangible way to mitigate our impact on the earth um, and kind of work alongside nature and, you know, try our very best not to disturb it as, as much as we possibly can. Um, so the kind of methods that we like to use are no-till or low-till methods, so we don't really till the land very much at all, kind of initially just to get things going um, and to get our beds prepped. And then we won't ever till it again is the idea. So hopefully we can stick to that. Um, we utilize things like occultation, solarization, mulching and cover crop, um, which are some kind of main factors in no-till farming. Um, and this bed prep that you can see here was due to occultation, which just means that we're laying tarps down to kind of smother the weeds um, and any crop residues. And then over time, it takes a little while, but over time, that's kind of what it looks like and it's ready for compost or any other soil amendments that we need. And then we can plant right into it without having to till it up. This is an example of solarization. So we're just using old greenhouse plastic to do that same thing, to prep the beds by killing weeds um, that way. And here's an example from last year of how we mulch things. So we use straw mulch or hay mulch sometimes, um, different kinds of plastic mulches, anything to really kind of keep that soil covered and keep, um, it's beneficial for us because it suppresses the weeds and it keeps moisture in, um, but then it's also beneficial for the microbiome under the soil. So earthworms really love a mulched situation. <laughs> And we really love what earthworms do for us. Um, so it's kind of, you know, mutually beneficial 
thing to do. Um, and as you can see, we use drip irrigation as much as possible um, to conserve water and um, really just kind of localize the irrigation right at the base of our crops. Sorry about the wind. <laughs> Um, so in addition to our no-till methods, we are also a chemical-free farm. So we don't spray any pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, anything like that for pests or diseases. Um, and sort of to get around that, we use this uh, white fabric here, which is just called row cover. There's lots of different brands that you can use, but it covers the, covers the seeded beds or the cropped beds. Um, Light can get in and water can penetrate, but bugs generally can't get in. Um, so that's, that's kind of our main method of um, keeping pests out. It doesn't always work, but it works pretty well. Um, and we also really kind of hand pick the variety of crops that we like to use um, starting from seed that are kind of um, more tuned to uh, our colder, you know, northern climates here and are drought tolerant or disease tolerant um, so that our plants can be really strong and we won't really have to worry about relying on um, pesticides or herbicides or anything like that. Um, another reason that we don't spray anything is because of, because we want to protect the native flora and fauna of the nature preserve. We are farming on a nature preserve after all. So these are just a handful of creatures that we have at the preserve <laughs> um, that I see all the time. So, you know, everybody's favorite monarch butterfly um, and caterpillar is just munching away on some milkweed last year. Um, this tiny little painted turtle that I was so sad I almost stepped on, but I did not. <laughs> um, and we also have a lot of birds of prey and the land trust keeps um, honeybees at the property too. So. We want to make sure that I am protecting our pollinators as much as possible. So I get this question a lot and I'm not certified organic. The farm is not certified, but we do grow that way. Um, and we use, you know, the organic handbook that the certification um, requires. And that means we're using organic potting mix, organic seeds, organic compost. Um, all of those things and then some, you know, we try to go above and beyond what the handbook allows. Um, I have a lot of issues with the organic certification that if you have listened to me on uh, the Voices of the Land podcast, you, you'd probably know about that. Um, <laughs> so that's just another, that's a, another topic for another time. But um, I just kind of think that knowing your farmer and where your food comes from is more important than that label. Um, and you can make it, you know, you can make a good informed decision about whether or not you really care um, if your food is or certified organic or not. And this is just a, an example of our gigantic garlic that we grew last year um, without using any synthetic fertilizers and um, it's not certified organic, but uh, you can get really beautiful, healthy crops um, without any of those things. And another aspect that is really important to us besides our environmental impact at Frontier Farm is our community impact. So um, we really focus on food accessibility. Um, that's super important to me. And it, it kind of always was, you know, long before the pandemic shed light on how, um, how big of an issue food accessibility is. So we participate in um, kind of all of the farmer's market programs, I think, that are out there in Rhode Island. So we accept SNAP at the farmer's markets. We accept um, the farmer's market nutrition program checks. And we're, I'm waiting on confirmation um, to see if we can accept the WIC farmer's market checks as well, which will be very exciting. Um, and we also have sliding scale payment options for our CSA structure to you know, make the CSA a little bit more accessible to those who maybe wouldn't have been able to afford it otherwise. Um, it's my personal belief that, you know, being able to care for the environment is kind of a privileged thing. So if you're, you know, you're able to do that, if you're not worried about where your next meal is coming from or um, housing or paying your bills or all those sorts of things. So this is just, you know, a tiny step in that direction to uh, alleviate some of that. 
Um, and also, you know, to about caring for our community. Um, we love to get involved with things like this and, um, you know, working with the land trust uh, and doing farm tours, which we've already done a couple of this year, um, which have gone well. And uh, in the past, we've done a little bit, um, we've participated a little bit with some youth education with the land trust and with Joe actually, and we really hope to do more of that um, in the coming years. So um, yeah, so that is kind of a little bit sort of briefly uh, what Frontier Farm is doing and what we're all about and what we care about. So um, that's just kind of my, you know, you can check out our website and our social media um, if you'd like to kind of keep up with us and see see what we're doing next. And that's that's it for me. So I'll stop I'll stop sharing that and move it on over. Thank you, Gusty. I'm going to pass it over to Gabby and Mary now. All right. Thanks, Joe. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Mary Gannon. I'm the Wildlife Outreach Coordinator for the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife. I'll let Gabby introduce herself. We're a tag team. so we. <laughs> I am Gabby Demila, and I'm the Technical Outreach Assistant for the Division of Fish and Wildlife, um, RIDEM, so Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, Division of Fish and Wildlife. So I think just to, if I can share my screen, I wanted to kind of show um, our webpage for the, for the wildlife outreach program. So essentially, uh, before I do that, but essentially what Gabby and I do at DEM is to uh, connect with the public. And that could be students, that could be families, that could be uh, adults, hunters, anglers, trappers, whoever, um, you know, just outdoor recreationists, bird watchers, basically anybody who is a Rhode Islander and will listen to us. <laughs> we will, um, we uh, promote uh, uh, knowledge of our conservation programs uh, that are run through our state division of fish and wildlife. Um, so that's, you know, spreading awareness about those conservation programs, spreading awareness about um, how conservation is funded uh, in our state uh, system. Uh, so a lot of people don't realize this, but um, most of our funding pretty much the majority of our funding at Fish and Wildlife is supported through the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program, which is primarily funded through the sale of firearms, ammunition, and archery equipment, as well as hunting licenses. Uh, so the idea of WISPER, as it's called, is that it was um, enacted in 1937 at a time when our, our wildlife species were really, really imperiled in, in this um, country, especially you know, in, across the country, but in Rhode Island, you'd be hard pressed to find a deer or a turkey uh, at the turn of the century. So a lot of our very important game species were on the decline. Uh, so this act was put into place uh, to work with the, the hunting, trapping, fishing community to say, well, if you are you know, accessing these resources for consumptive use, then you should be contributing something to their conservation. Uh, so that, um, that act put an excise tax on firearms, ammo, archery equipment, boating equipment, uh, things like that, and it extended, um, you know, it's expanded as, uh, as time has gone on. Uh, so like archery was not included in that original, um, in that original act, but archery has become very popular. Um, so the idea is that hunters will contribute to that, but we've also seen an increase in just sport shooters. Like Gabby and I do target archery. We do not hunt, but we really enjoy going to the range and channeling our inner Katniss and <laughs> pretending we're in the Hunger Games. And that's really, you know, the Hunger Games and things like that, uh, you know, showcasing archery has really made it a popular sport. And that's really cool um, that that's been able to help fund uh, wildlife conservation in the state. So um, that money that we receive um, from those excise taxes, it goes through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who then distribute it to uh, all of the states uh, across the country. And then we have to use it for land acquisition or habitat management for research and monitoring of wildlife. Uh, so basically what Gabby and I do is we spread awareness about that because a lot of people don't know that and we highlight all of those really cool projects that we're able to accomplish uh, with that whisper uh, generated funding as well as the state wildlife grant uh, generated funding as well. Gabby, do you wanna talk a little bit about state wildlife grants and how that's a little bit different? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So we also um, have funding for what we call non-game species, which are just any kind of wildlife that aren't 
hunted. Um, so things like turtles and songbirds, um, reptiles, amphibians, um, all of those things would fall under non-game. And so all of the states were required to create a wildlife action plan that looked for uh, species that needed a little bit of extra help. So what we call species of greatest conservation need, and they would address uh, the threats to those species and then some actions to take to address those threats. And um, so we actually get funding through, it's under underneath WISFR is the SWIG state wildlife grants. And we get funding to help uh, monitor and do research on non-game species and also to help educate on non-game species also. So Mary and I help with that too. So it's another way that we're funded and another uh, great way that the state is able to contribute to conservation. Yeah, so if you're interested in learning about all this cool conservation work, I mean, we could sit here, we could just steamroll the whole presentation, <laughs> take over for the next hour and a half, but, uh, but we won't do that. But if you're interested in attending any of these programs or participating in our outreach efforts, uh, we highly encourage you uh, to join us. So um, this is just our, our main webpage where you can find all of our information. So it's just dem.ri.gov slash wildlife outreach. Um, and it'll bring you to this main page. So that kind of details some of the things that we do. We've got a little online calendar. So we've got a young wildlife uh, program coming up uh, in uh, May, early May, talking about what do I do if I find a baby bird? What do I do if I find a fawn? Because we get a lot of calls at our office um, with concerned members of the public who are just, I don't know what to do. So we're trying to you know, help address some of those questions uh, while highlighting some of our projects as well. Um, so we highly encourage you to uh, check out the webpage uh, and join us for an event. Um, another thing that Gabby and I uh, really love to focus on are youth programs. So we work a lot with, um, with students. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we were going into classrooms every week and doing uh, programs with kids. Um, so now that the pandemic hit, it was kind of giving us sort of an opportunity to shift towards uh, an, an initiative that we really wanted to do for a while, which is our roadie critter kits. Um, so we have five kits available for free for educators, uh, whether that's a formal classroom educator or uh, Joe at the, at the land trust is using them uh, with his students, uh, which is great. So we have um, these little kits that we've curated uh, that include lesson plans, that include background information. So if you're an educator and you're like, I don't know anything about birds, but it might be kind of cool to do a lesson. We have a bunch of background info uh, to help you get up to speed. Um, to, to deliver a lesson. And uh, we've included videos, we've made uh, interviews with our biologists. Uh, so it's all, you know, it's about bringing kids closer to the wildlife that's right in their backyard, because a lot of wildlife themed units and lesson plans we notice seem to be about things that don't live here. So uh, we wanted to provide Rhode Island specific information uh, to increase that connection with what's happening right outside of your window, uh, as opposed to even across the country, um, you know, thinking about, you know, we talk about wildlife in America, they're talking about stuff that's way out in Yellowstone, how many, you know, Rhode Island students have been to Yellowstone, but they've probably seen, you know, maybe seen a bat in their backyard, or maybe come across a toad in their garden, um, or just, you know, even if you're in the city, all of the different birds that we have, you know, the peregrine falcons right in the city. Uh, so just really, a really, really fun uh, project for Gabby and me uh, working on these kits. Uh, so if you know an educator, please, um, please let them know about this. We're here to help, we're here to support them. Uh, we also write a youth magazine, The Wild Rhode Island Explorer. This comes out four times a year and um, it's written for about fourth to seventh grade reading level, but we have subscribers of all ages, including adults, <laughs> some, some young at heart subscribers who enjoy reading it. Uh, so each issue features uh, an interview with either a biologist or one of our partner uh, researchers. So uh, coming up, uh, for our summer um, issue, we'll be interviewing a graduate student at URI who's studying American woodcock, uh, and we're helping to fund his study and work alongside of him as he um, as he tracks uh, woodcock around uh, the Great Swamp management area. So it's really cool. We're going to interview Colby. Uh, we've got some fun little uh, activities and games and things like that. Uh, there's a fishing corner um, a corner uh, page that's dedicated to our hunter education program. Uh, so one, one article that's coming up is about archery, just all about archery practice. Um, so there's like a little something for everybody in the magazine. Um, and so, and we are also publishing it in Spanish now as well. Uh, so this is free to subscribe. You can subscribe online to get it in your inbox. You can also subscribe for mail, um, 
mail subscription to your home or uh, to your school as well. So we send out school packets. That's pretty much uh, also in a nutshell, you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Instagram, uh, YouTube, the DEM has a YouTube channel, which Gabby and I have kind of <laughs> taken over by storm with uh, recordings of our virtual programs. If you can't make one, um, we do post them there. I'm going to stop here. And Gabby, do you want to add anything? I feel like I covered a lot. <laughs> just a yeah, yeah, I was just, I'll just add one, uh, one other note. So I help Mary with the wildlife outreach side, but I also help Jennifer Brooks, who is our volunteer coordinator for the Division of Fish and Wildlife. And so I'll just put it out there that we have a lot of really cool volunteer opportunities to get the community involved. Uh, some of them are hands-on experiences, um, like we have uh, goose banding in the summertime. So hopefully we'll be able to do that this year. It was kind of uh, put on hold for volunteers last year, but we have um, some other ones coming up. We have a Diamondback Terrapin Surveyor uh, volunteer opportunity where people can go out to salt marshes and see if they can see little turtle heads popping up and then report back to us if they see any. Uh, we have bat counts coming up. So watching bats as they leave their maternity roosts and counting them before and after they have babies to uh, figure out recruitment or how many new pups are born each year. Um, and then there are some other really cool ones that you don't need our help with at all, except for that you need to download an app on your phone. So one of the ones that we have uh, that is year round is called Herp Observer. So you download survey one, two, three, and then you can download the survey called Herp Observer and you can report any sightings of reptiles or amphibians in the state. So snakes, turtles, frogs, toads, salamanders. Um, and all you have to do is take a picture and you put in a little bit of information about where you are. And it goes straight to our state herpetologist who studies reptiles and amphibians. And then it can use that to figure out kind of how our population of reptiles and amphibians are doing in the state. So it's a really cool way to get involved, super easy. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can just go to dem.ri.gov slash herpobserver for all of the instructions. And with that, I will stop talking and we'll, we'll give someone else a chance. <laughs> that is incredible work. And yeah, your critter kits are amazing. I just used the reptiles and amphibians, um, the scales and slimes as it's, as it's called, uh, this past Wednesday. And the kids found like, a dozen salamanders that day. So, so I should download Survey 123 and start uploading those pictures that I got and record the yep. observations. Scott would be so happy, our state herpetologist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dave, take it away. All right. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, again, my name is Dave Prescott. I am the South County Coast Keeper for Save the Bay. Um, for those of you who don't know Save the Bay, we've been around for about 50 years now. Um, uh, we work to protect um, Narragansett Bay, the watershed, and the southern coast, which is actually where I get to work, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, you know, we have our, our education staff, which outreaches to about 40,000 um, students and people a year. Um, out of the 40,000, about 15,000 of those are students alone. Um, we have our policy staff as well as our habitat restoration staff, which is, is part of what I'm involved with. So I'll talk about that. Um, but again, um, uh, kind of all over the state. Um, as my job as South County Coast Keeper first, I always get the question is, how did you get to be a Coast Keeper? <laughs> you know, um, I am one of 350 water keepers around the country and around the world um, that serve as the eyes and ears for their local water body. Um, it, we are actually, our, our, our title um, is licensed through the Waterkeeper Alliance, which is a global movement towards clean water, but I work for Save the Bay. Um, on staff, we actually have three water keepers. We have myself as the coast keeper, we have the Narragansett Bay keeper, and we actually have the Narragansett Bay river keeper. And we all cover different um, portions of the state and different um, issues within those portions. So. What do I get to do? Well, um, for uh, those of you who don't know, we actually have an office in Westerly. Um, I have been running the South County office out of Westerly since 2007. Um, I've been with the organization for about 20 years now. And my day is different each and every single day. Um, and it can change on a dime. So I get to work on lots of different projects, actually so, so several projects we've already talked about with, um, with Joe and, and Gabby and Mary and, and, and whatnot. Um, there is such a huge connection between the land and the health of our waters. 
So anything that, ha that bad that can happen on land will definitely have an impact on the waters. Um, so um, in terms of what I get to work on, first thing is water quality. Um, for the past 13 years, um, testing through URI Watershed Watch, I work directly on Little Narragansett Bay and the lower Pawcatuck River um, to help um, uh, not, only the, the, not only save the bait, better understand the resource, but also working directly with DEM, working with EPA, working with Connecticut DEP um, on, on the health of our waters, looking at everything from wastewater, um, storm water, um, uh, it, you know, nitrogen in the water, bacteria in the water, and that really plays a really huge role, especially as my role as a coast keeper, because in order for us to serve as the eyes and ears in the water, we have to know how healthy our water is. And the best way to do that is to actually get out there, see what's happening and actually test that water. So water quality remains probably one of the biggest programs um, that I work on directly down here in the, the South, South County region. Um, uh, the other thing that's kind of really exciting that kind of impacts all of us that live in this region um, and have been involved with it for, for now the past 12 years is now we have an official national designation for our first wild and scenic river system here in South County for the Wood Pocketuck Rivers. Um, and this is super exciting for Rhode Island. Um, it, it, it provides a much higher level of, of protection, not only from the local level, state level, but also on the federal level. And this None of this could have ever happened without all of our partners from the state, local organizations, local communities, towns, everyone getting together saying that, hey, the wood in Pocketuck rivers are really, really important. They're really special and they need to be protected in perpetuity. So I get to work a lot on that too. Um, uh, probably the other biggest issue that I work on is, um, is climate change and all the impacts that um, climate change has on our local water. So looking at um, uh, sea level uh, and, 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 and the rise of sea level and, and what that does to our local environment, looking at coastal erosion, um, again, looking at you know, precipitation events, everything that has an impact on our local waters. Um, and, and, and so I get to look at um, uh, development issues uh, along our shoreline, looking at illegal seawalls and trying to get those removed, um, lots of different things. But in addition to that, um, one of the, the pieces of that, instead of just going and testifying or speaking in front of a town or, or a committee, is actually the, really a lot of the on the ground work. Um, one of the pictures that Joe actually had in his, his beginning slides was uh, that part of the land trust property on Winnipeg Pond that includes a, a, a pretty significant salt marsh. Save the Bay has been working on um, salt marsh restoration now for, you know, probably 30, almost 40 years um, of, of trying to get a better handle on the health of our, our local habitats. And salt marshes remain one of the biggest ones um, that we work on. And also one of the most challenging ones because right in front of our eyes, these really super important habitats are disappearing. You know, historically we used to see salt marshes as nothing better than sti slimy, stinky, smelly, good for nothing get a bunch of dirt, fill them in, try to build on top of them. I mean, look at the like cities like Providence and Boston and New York, all salt marshes that we actually filled in there. But salt marshes are extremely, extremely important because of all the important functions that they provide. Not only are they a really important habitat for birds, fish, crabs, and whatnot, um, they're a buffer against storms, they're a filter, they're a nursery for a lot of those baby fish birds and crabs that live in there, um, and, and, and lots of other functions that are slowly being lost as, as higher sea levels um, push water further and further in. And when they push that water further and further in, our marshes are remaining flooded for a lot longer. And when that happens, all those really important grasses and the, and the peat, the, the basically the, 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 the soil and the plants and whatnot that come together um, are, are basically breaking down and, and we're losing them because of these higher sea levels and because of the other implant acts from there. So one of the big issues that, one of the big topics that we've been working on over the past, and now going on five-ish years, um, has been working with our partners at the local and definitely at the state level, including both DEM, um, CRMC, so Coastal Resources Management Council, um, US Fish and Wildlife, again, local towns such as Westerly, Charlestown and whatnot on trying to 
utilize um, sand from the breachways that needs to be dredged. And instead of putting it back directly on the beach, actually putting it onto the surface of the marsh to help build up the surface of the marsh. Um, and what we're doing is basically replicating normally what would have happened after a major storm prior to us developing these areas here. And so two of those big projects are right in this area. Um, one is in um, uh, Charlestown in, uh, in Ninigrit Marsh. Um, that one we're going on the uh, fourth year um, of, 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 of that project in, in terms of, of, of um, uh, basically adaptive management as well as um, replanting and whatnot. That marsh alone, we've replanted over 100,000 salt marsh vegetation plant, vegetation um, in, in that area there and it's coming back um, almost to the point that it's really hard to recognize that anything had happened to that marsh, except for the fact that because the elevation is higher because of that sand, um, those plants and the animals that live within that salt marsh now have a place to actually migrate to. So going back to the Wesley Land Trust property, which Joe actually came out with last, last week or the week before, um, um, uh, we're, we're actually working down there with, um, again, with DEM, working with uh, DEM's mosquito abatement coordinator, which has a low ground pressure um, excavator, where we are basically um, working to create very shallow ditches to allow the natural drainage of the marsh to not only allow the fresh water to come off the um, uh, to come off the land because that's actually a really important thing, but also to allow salt water as it comes in there to kind of keep those invasive plants such as Phragmites, that tall reed grass that you see everywhere, kind of keep that at bay. Um, so that's a really big project that we're working with, and and it's such a huge connection to our land um, because of the fact is that as we see sea level sea level um, Sea, sea levels increase, more and more of our land adjacent to the coast is being flooded. So now's the time to really be looking at land conservation, especially in these areas, to, so that we can actually allow these salt marshes to be able to migrate into the future and to have future corridors where these salt marshes can actually make their way and to preserve all those really important functions. Um, and in terms of, you know, just in terms of the whole idea of sea level rise and whatnot, um, we're fortunate here in Rhode Island to have one of the oldest tide gauges in the country. Um, we've seen about close to 11 inches of sea level rise since about the 1930s, but the majority of that sea level rise has really happened within since 1990. So we've really been on an exp exponential rise and that's causing not only a lot more inland flooding, flooding of things like roads and homes and, and their lawns and whatnot, but also habitats. And, and it's, a, it's a big thing going forward. And it's something that we're definitely having a big, big role with. Um, and finally, one last thing that's actually really um, important, important issue that we're working on is public access. I think in the midst of this past year, um, where we have all been told not to leave anywhere. We've been trying to get out and actually explore our environment, get outside, you know, kind of get back to a little bit of normal with masks on, of course. Um, but one of the challenges that we found is that public access is being limited everywhere. And one, we are so fortunate in the state to have some really, really, really strong protection of our right to access the, the, the ocean to, you know, to bathe or to collect seaweed or whatnot in our constitution. Um, yet, as more development happens, as sea levels get higher and whatnot, these areas are all being challenged and whatnot. So public access is another really big topic that we work on. And, and we're really fortunate that, you know, there are a lot of places, whether it's from our local land conservation groups, our land trusts and whatnot, that we can actually get down to these areas, whether it is a farm or it's a, you know, a walk through the woods or even down to a salt marsh so we can get down there and actually explore our shoreline. So um, that's kind of my, my position in a nutshell. Like I said, each and every day is different. I can be on the water one day and all of a sudden have to respond to a to an oil spill because I'm in the midst of one. So I call my partners at the Coast Guard and DEM and whatnot, and we work on that or, or you know, a, a sewage discharge or something like that. So for me, every single day changes, um, but there are always opportunities for everyone, um, whether you work for an environmental organization like we do or an agency, um, or, or you're just a, a, someone who loves the outdoors and wanna get more involved. I think both Gabby and Mary talked about the opportunities for volunteers. Save the Bay, we have some really great opportunities to get out there to help us replant the salt marsh, to help us to um, get involved with the beach cleanup 
and, and, and lots, lots of other opportunities out there. So definitely um, you can check out our website as well. It's, it's uh, savebay.org. There's no the in between it. So it's savebay.org. But, um, you know, finally, I just think the best thing for us to do is, is to get out there and, 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 to, and to, to love, learn all about our environment and learn to love it and, and learn to help protect it. So thank you. That is a great message for Earth Day. Very appropriate. Uh, I'm really glad that you brought up the work that's being done in Winnipeg Pond uh, because we were seeing immediate results when I was out there. The runnels have just been dug and already we saw mummachog uh, and true. eels. And also that snail that we found, I put it on iNaturalist. And for those who don't know, iNaturalist is just this observation app that you take a picture of some wild animal or plant that you see um, and it'll identify it for you. And so I just clicked, like, I don't know what the snail was. So I just clicked the first one that was there that's a visually similar scene nearby. And I said, cool, probably it. But we must have some amazing snail experts in the area because I had a bunch of comments on the iNaturalist post. They're like, I can see why you said that, but this has <laughs> like a, a, a clockwise spiral, but it's found in a salt marsh. And this kind of snail is not found in a salt marsh. So, so I should send you that those comments because uh, we might have a new species in Winnipeg Pond. <laughs> You never know. Yeah, you yeah, absolutely yeah. never know. So, um, yeah, but yeah, that, that's, that's been a, it's these projects, you know, yes, we're out there with, um, with that low ground pressure uh, excavator. Again, the one that, that, that belongs to the DEM, um, the mosquito abatement program, but it's really essential in terms of, uh, to, again, to, to kind of underscore the fact that to get that drainage from get that fresh water out of that area there um, to get all, get it out of the kind of the, the, the impacted Phragmites or that reed grass there, but also allow that salt water to come in there to naturally kind of to, to be able to keep that at bay, but also to allow exactly what you said, Joe, to allow those mummy chugs to come back in there and those eels and whatnot. Um, it's, it's super exciting because um, those are the kind of those are the kind of creatures that we want to see in there. Um, yet, for again, for so long, we've really challenged um, these local habitats because of, of of trying to drain marshes initially. You know, trying to you know build on them, you know, fill them in and whatnot. But again, they're super super important for you know our future going forward, and especially for the health of our our local waters. Yeah, and I had never seen. I don't think I'd ever seen a wild eel before. Um, and so I was reminded of when I bring the kids out to the preserves when they, when they. Like, they found salamanders for the first time. Uh, it's just incredible to see these reactions. So I wanted to actually turn it over to Cassidy for a second because we just gave farm tours at Barlow on Tuesday. And I was mentioning how when this agriculture is done in a sustainable way, it actually promotes biodiversity in the area. Because yeah, we could have left it and then be some wildflowers, but this like draws animals in. So I wanna just hear your take on, on that sustainable agriculture and biodiversity. Um. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily really have a good answer as to like why that happens. Um, that's interesting that you say that. I, I don't know. I think maybe I'm just like so tunnel vision into like the growing of the plants. <laughs> um, but I would, I mean, I guess like my best educated guess would just be that like, I'm not necessarily out there. So, okay. So before, before um, the three of us farmers were on that piece of property, it was, um, as far as I know, it was uh, like a, a family farm that was just a hay field for so long. So this other local farmer would come and hay it a couple times a year. And so like, you just kind of have this like, just this meadow happening. Um, and then, you know, this big machinery that comes in and hays it. So yeah, there's really just like not a lot of diversity, not even within like the natural like hay grasses and like the natural perennial plants that are in there in this like big open space. Um, and then you're kind of disturbing it like several times a year, right? But since we've been there, you know, we have like Stephanie's flower patch is getting bigger and bigger um, <laughs> and the honeybees are there. And, and then like, I mean, last year was like a a banner year for bugs, for um, agricultural pest bugs, which was awful. But um, yeah, there's just like a lot. I think when you bring in more biodiversity of plants um, and you're not like, we're not, I don't have, I don't have a tractor yet. I mean, I don't wanna do, you know, obviously, like I said, a lot of tillage or anything like that, but yeah, I'm just not, you know, we're not creating like a ton of noise and like disturbance and stuff out there. So I think, 
yeah, I think it's just like the environment has changed ever so slightly. Um, I don't know. I guess I don't really have a great answer for that. It's just kind of like stream of consciousness thought <laughs> about what could be happening. Um, One thing that I, I would say might make a difference. I mean, if there aren't big, heavy tractors flattening and compacting the soil, that's going to allow for other organisms to come in, for bugs to come in. For, uh, we just did a really cool uh, collaborative project with a bunch of different organizations, uh, Rhode Island Natural History Survey, URI, and a, a million other that I can't remember all of them. Um, but we're actually creating spade foot pools. So these pools for um, spade foot toads, which are a really unique species of toad. They're actually a species of greatest conservation need, like we were mentioning in the, the wildlife action plan. And they need really specific habitat types. And we were creating this pool in an old farm field. And it was so compact that we had to dig it all up and then loosen the soil so that they'd be able to burrow down because they actually spend a lot of their time underneath the soil. So it could be something just like that. You're, you're not compacting the soil quite as much. You're, you're turning it up and allowing for a lot of other things to get into the soil that couldn't make it through before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, that, that makes total sense. Um, yeah, that's something that I've, no, I've noticed. You know, I've farmed for several different farmers throughout Rhode Island over the years. Um, in this piece of land at the Barlow Nature Preserve, the soil is so soft. And it's so like, you don't see that in Rhode Island. It's usually very compacted if it's farmland. Um, and there, it's not that rocky either, <laughs> which is kind of crazy too. Um, so in part of, you know, part of, I think something that maybe I forgot to mention in my slides was that we do a lot of cover cropping too um, and crop rotation. So um, that's important for, you know, lots of farming reasons, but also for, um, you know, maintaining that biodiversity and kind of actually building the soil to be better than what it was before. Um, so that, that, you know, just in the past two years or two and a half years that I've taken soil samples at that piece of property, um, there are, you know, we have increased certain um, nutrients in the soil just from like the couple, you know, types of cover crops that we've had or like the, you know, year or two that there have been some nitrogen fixing cover crops on there. So I would, yeah, I would probably say that that's, you know, contributing at least. Another thing that comes to mind, so Cassidy, you said you're not spraying pesticides and chemicals and all that sort of stuff, you know, that when, when you spray pesticides to kill one particular pest, if it's a really voracious beetle <laughs> and you're targeting mm -hmm. that beetle, it kills a bunch of other stuff too that may not even be a problem for you, your, what you're growing, but it just, they're not like, oh, it's only going to kill that one thing and everything else is safe. So that, um, you know, that alone is huge. Not, you know, finding alternative methods, like you were saying with the, the cloth cover and just thinking about different ways of reducing um, your issues with, with pests, because obviously you need to not lose your, it's not a backyard garden like, oh, oh, I lost my lettuce. You know, you, you're trying to, you know, get food to the community. So you don't want to lose your lettuce. Um, but when, um, when with, uh, with insect biodiversity, there's a really cool, um, really cool book, um, Bringing Nature Home, uh, Doug Tallamy. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of books that he's, he's written and he's a um, professor at University of Delaware. I believe I can't remember exactly where he teaches, but he um, he advocates for this like insect diversity, um, and and not you know spraying a chemical soup on you know whether it's your farm or just your your own backyard, um, and instead incorporating plant diversity, but not just you know any plants, but native plants particularly. Um, at least in like a backyard landscape, like you can add native plants. I I have milkweed. You know, like you said, there's milkweed on the farm that. <laughs> drawing in the monarch butterflies and then they're going to lay their eggs and the caterpillars will have food and etc but if you just like sprayed a bunch of herbicides to kill all the weeds everywhere you know then that would eliminate that food source for the for the monarchs um so basically what he's trying to say is that when you build up that plant biodiversity you add like some host plants so monarchs only eat milkweed that's a host plant for them um you know, they'll pollinate other plants, but the, the baby, the, those little fat caterpillars are only eating that, that milkweed plant. Um, when you do that and you support insect biodiversity, then what are insects, but the bottom of the food chain. So when you have, if you want birds in your yard, then you should 
encourage caterpillars because <laughs> caterpillars, except for the, the monarchs are, are poisonous. So nothing eats the, the monarch caterpillars, but you know, all those chubby little caterpillars that are wandering around your yard are a really good food source for birds. And that's a protein source for them. And baby birds are almost exclusively fed on caterpillars. So that's like a huge thing that you wouldn't even think of like, okay, yeah, don't spray things. So then that increases the amount of bugs and that'll increase the amount of birds and other things that, that eat insects like bats. Um, you know, bats will take care of those agricultural pests as well. They're not just eating mosquitoes, they're eating moths and beetles as well. Um, so I think that is just a huge step in the right direction for all wildlife, you know, because you think, well, what does farming have to do with wildlife or even water quality? You know, or it, it's all interconnected. Um, like Dave was saying, you know, what, what happens on land is gonna directly affect what's happening on our coast too. Oh, just my my two cents about plant your native plants. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree. And you you um, also reminded me too that we so this this past March we just finally finished um, building our propagation house. So the the only greenhouse that we have on the property. So I'm super excited, and that's just like a huge game changer for us. So we'll be growing. Um, uh, greenhouse tomatoes and we'll be overwintering greens in there and things like that. But uh, one of the things, I mean, you can do this in the field too, but it's it, it's easier in the greenhouse is that um, instead of, you know, you get a lot of folks that will spray their tomato plants. Tomatoes are highly susceptible, especially in the greenhouse to disease and fungus and all sorts of things um, and pests, particularly aphids. Um, but we will, we will uh, bring in um, beneficial insects. So there are companies that you can purchase native beneficial insects and release them in your greenhouse and they will go to town eating the bugs that you don't want to be there and then they won't you know, hurt your plants and it's kind of a win-win situation. Um, you know, we could do that in the fields but they, the chance of them just kind of like flying away and leaving <laughs> um, is much bigger. But we did have a situation last summer where I did have a ton of aphids on my eggplant and then I just you know kind of stuck it out a little bit and then lo and behold like a couple weeks in um, there was like a ton of you know I could start to see the um, uh, ladybug larvae um, and they you know eat aphids and the ladybugs themselves um, so I was like yay <laughs> nature is helping me <laughs> Um, and we also have in the propagation house right now, it's kind of rodents are like a huge issue that farmers battle, especially um, with your seedlings. So I have kind of excluded them with like a little cage around some of my seedling trays um, so that the mice don't eat my spinach seeds. And it's been working out great. Um, and I'm not, you know, having gotten a wildlife degree, I'm like, I don't want to kill anything <laughs> like ever. That's not to say some folks like feel that way, feel the same way. But um, so, you know, I'm not going to use like rat poison or, uh, you know, I would do, you know, maybe traps if I absolutely had to, if it was like out of control. But I just saw yesterday, actually kind of our resident red tailed hawk at the nature preserve, like screeching and flying above and I'm pretty sure like she had a mouse and I was like yes it's all working to plan um and you know knowing that that mouse didn't eat any rat poison you know that red-tailed hawk is going to be completely fine eating that mouse so yeah it's just it's kind of you know we're as farmers you're naturally trying to like manipulate the land to get what you want out of it but if you like are you know if you try to do it in harmony with nature nature will kind of like scratch your back as well so yeah it just takes some patience Cassie that's so perfect because of what I was going to say I, I have a couple things to follow up on is especially with the you know the pesticides and the fertilizers you know so many times they they do have a huge impact especially from a fertilizer side on on our local waters i mean we see a big proliferation of algae in little narragansett bay because of excess nutrients and it's it's super extensive it's a good 100 plus acres of this really thick green algae that lives at the bottom of little narragansett bay and it's basically smothering um the normal life that would live there um, but the second piece is, is that whole piece about harmony and, um, you know, especially this time of year when, you know, 
our grass is starting to grow. Some of our flowers are popping up and whatnot. You know, the our our local um, nurseries are are becoming a lot busier, and people looking for the perfect plants. And and Mary said this too. I think one of the most important lessons for for everyone is is to really take to heart that whole piece about planting native. Um, native plants are beautiful. Native plants grow here locally, and that's what you want. You don't want some beautiful exotic plant that it takes you five hours a week to try to keep it alive just because of that. You want something that's going to live here in all conditions, in heavy rain and droughts and whatnot. Um, one of the things that we do is um, in, in Charlestown here, I worked on a grant for the last several years on, on building rain gardens and um, planting those on um, public property to serve as demonstration projects so that when people come along, and they see them, they say, hey, I have a downspout. This could be kind of good if I did that there. And then learning from the fact of actually planting natives. And one of the best stories was the fact that we, we were doing one over at Nintegrate Park at the Frosty Drew Center. And we had just planted some uh, seaside goldenrod. And no word of a lie, had just put it in the ground. Within three minutes of putting it in the ground, all of a sudden, a butterfly came over and landed on it. You know, like, so like we want those really beneficial pollinators, the butterflies, the birds, the bees and whatnot. And the best thing that anyone can do, because I think a lot of times they say, well, you guys are all, you're talking, this is all great stuff, but I, I'm, I, I have just my home and a little garden, but anyone can do that. They can go to their no local nursery and ask what is local. You know, if it's a good nursery, they'll tell you, you know, you can see where it comes from. And, and, and again, once you get it planted in the ground, it does not take much time that it's basically on its own and it proliferates on its own. And it's probably very similar Cassidy to the field, you know, it's just like, you know, it's starting to take over now. And that's, that's the, like the best thing, but that's, that's really what anyone can do is really take the time find native. There's some really great nurseries around here. Um, if there's, and, and besides that, if it's, if it sounds too overwhelming to try to figure out what is native, your eye has an excellent plant guide that you can look it up and you say, Hey, I, I would like to find, you know, I want to plant my garden. That's full sun. What can I put in there? You can select these little things and it'll tell you not only which plants to plant, but where you can get them from. So there are some great tools out there for anyone, any homeowner and whatnot that can that can help our local environment by, by really getting these beneficial pollinators and whatnot and putting something in the ground that is adapted to our local climate. So kind of like along the lines of uh, living in harmony with the environment, we Mary and I uh, developed this uh, wildlife solution series because at the office we get tons of calls from people um, about wildlife and what they're doing and they're, they're concerned about seeing them more often or you know they're in their gardens like their groundhogs in the garden eating up everything. Um, so we developed this to kind of talk to people about uh, why wildlife is doing what they're doing each time of year. So they're aligned with the seasons. So we have one coming up in July and it's called vegetable vandals. <laughs> so it's all about um, groundhogs and uh, deer and rabbits and how to keep them out of your garden. So not necessarily trapping them. We'll give you information about like what's legal and what's not, but it's not necessarily about trapping them, but how to keep them out of your gardens and how to you know plant things that might not be appealing to them. And then we have another one in the fall that's um, called Noisy Neighbors, and that's about um, excluding bats and squirrels from homes, because that's another thing we get a lot of calls about. So not necessarily trapping them, because that doesn't solve the issue, but taking away those resources that are attracting them and then sealing everything up so they can't get back in. <laughs> so we, those are um, coming up summer and fall, and if you're interested in those, you can check out that page, our wildlife outreach page that Mary showed you, but kind of along the same lines of living alongside wildlife, but not having to you know, combat it, but just what do they want? What are we providing that we don't realize that we're providing and how can we remove those attractants? I actually learned a lot about bats with the critter kits because um, I had to read over all the materials before I talked to the kids about bats. And one of the things that was mentioned in there was how much of a bio control bats are, especially with agriculturalists, um, because they eat a thousand to 2000 bugs per night. So it's a, it's a natural form of uh, pest control. Um, and so I had to learn about them 
in order to teach the kids about bats, not about the mathematics and the economics behind bat control, but how to love the bats, how to have empathy for the nature. You need to learn to respect it and to love nature before you learn how to conserve it or why you should conserve it. Yeah, that's one of the things that you know Gabby and I focus on, you know, is just that um, that joy, you know, of of nature and like why are why are why conserve it? Why bother? You know, does anybody enjoy it? You know, we have to enjoy nature. And, what, and, that, and that comes in many different forms too. So, you know, maybe enjoying nature for you is going on a really long hike. And for somebody who lives in the city and maybe is never been to, you know, a Arcadia, you know, that, that might be intimidating to, to people um, if you've never done it before, but maybe enjoying nature is planting a native patch of flowers. We have a coworker, Amanda, um, Amanda Freitas, who's our wildlife action plan community liaison. So she deals with community groups. She works with towns and municipalities to work on best ways um, to incorporate the wildlife action plan into their town planning. And um, she's just a brilliant individual, um, but I, I can't even encompass all the things that she does. But Amanda uh, lives in the city and, and chooses to live in the city. And she has made it a point to plant those natives and make her little tiny little garden in this postage stamp lot in the middle of the city a welcome place for wildlife so that you know that's you know connecting with nature and enjoying nature you don't have to go far to do it um but i i think you know or, or you know we we mentioned we work a lot with hunters and people say well, why how can hunters you know you're, you're hunting the animals how does that factor in and, and most hunters you talk to like, oh, I love sitting in my tree stand. It's so peaceful and quiet, you know, and it's not about, you know, yeah, they get to take a deer home, maybe if they're lucky, you know, if they, if they have a successful hunt for that season and they, they bring food home to their family and nice, natural, totally like talk about like free range, organic protein right there. You know, that's, that's a way that they access food um, in the most natural way. But, you know, it's not just about bringing home the venison it's also about like oh i'm sitting there and a, a bird landed on my shoulder because i was in camo when it didn't know i was you know part of the tree and so that that's another level of enjoyment so kind of finding your own niche and in a way that you can you know fit into that conservation story because you know we all work for different organizations and we all work towards that same goal right of of conserving our our wild places and and the species that live there and um you know or or mitigating our own impacts um but one, th one thing I kind of want to jump back on, because I, I love talking about habitat. Gabby goofs on me all the time. So I'm like, oh, habitat plants. I love, it's like my favorite thing. Um, but one thing that, you know, thinking about like things that we all can do and, you know, and um, Dave was saying, you know, you're, oh, I just got my yard, you know, what can I possibly do? But if you look at Rhode Island, we're a highly developed state. Uh, the whole eastern half of the state, you know, you can draw like a line if you look at Google Earth. Um, and see the development and how that's kind of, you know, creeping out, creeping out, creeping out. Um, so, and we, we've conserved, you know, the, the state has conserved large chunks of land in our management areas, you know, across the Western half of the state. And that, you know, we do that in, not just on our own, but in conjunction with Audubon, Nature Conservancy. Um, you know, we try to, the, the, we have a couple of uh, partnership uh, uh, properties with Nature Conservancy, grass, grass Pond Management Area and Tillinghast Pond Management Area, two beautiful spots where our state land and PNC land sit right next to each other. So we try to connect those habitats and, and work in tandem um, rather than saying like, oh, this is ours, this is yours. You know, it's like, yeah, what's the goal? Conserve wildlife habitat and stick it together and connect that puzzle. Um, and that's, that's great. You know, we've got this nice corridor on the Western uh, side of the state. And, um, but the thing is, is that, you know, that's, that's not just nature. You know, wildlife is not just in the western half of the state. We get calls from, uh, you know, Newport, Portsmouth, there's coyotes walking down the street, you know, so wildlife is everywhere. Um, so the same, you know, something that Gabby and I like to talk about when we talk about our habitat management, oh, we're talking large scale on, you know, 3,000 acres of land. What are we doing for conservation of habitat and management of habitat? Well, I don't have 3,000 acres. I got a half an acre in Cranston. Does that matter? Yes, it does. You know, because all of our little properties, no matter how big, whether you got a postage stamp lot in the city or you got, you know, a couple of acres in suburbia, that all counts and that's all a potential, enormous potential to provide connectivity for wildlife and provide a welcoming place. 
but also, you know, while avoiding conflict. So, you know, if you need to not have a fox denning underneath your deck to make sure it's all closed off, that the fox doesn't den there, but maybe you provide a brush pile, you know, further out in the yard, if you have the space, if it's not, you know, going to be like on top of you, <laughs> maybe providing that brush pile gives an appropriate place for that fox um, and encourages, you know, that fox to be there and eating rodents so you don't have a mouse problem anymore. Um, so you don't have to put down the rat poison, you know, which is technically illegal. <laughs> so in this state, it's not, it's not no, no good uh, for put, putting down poisons for animals. Um, but I think that, you know, thinking of like, that's one thing I try to focus on on Earth Day is like, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to own a big piece of land. You don't have to, you know, have tons of, you know, clout and influence. You can just do your own little thing right where you're at. And it does make a difference if a lot of people do it. You know, so even just like if one person does it, you know, I had my little monarch caterpillars on my milkweed at my curb and it worked for them, you know, but is anybody else doing that in my neighborhood? Maybe I, I talk to my neighbors all the time, like, hey, I have cool native plants. You can too. You know, so once you start doing it, you know, that that ripple effect. Um, really can make a huge difference um, for, for our wildlife. I, I say wildlife, you know, but because I focus on wildlife, but everything, everything will benefit um, from that collaborative effort. Absolutely. And to go back to the development for a sec, for a, a second, um, it is, it is still wildlife. It is still a habitat. Like just walking on the street, you're still outdoors. Even in the city, you'll still find birds, insects, maybe some rodents, but they're still wildlife. Um, and that's one of the things that we try to convey on the podcast, the Voices of the Land podcast, just how intersectional everything is, that wildlife really, like there's no escaping it. To wildlife, the buildings that we built are the void. And they're like, what do we do with this? <laughs> what is this? Where are the trees? Where are the grasses? One of the things um, when Mary was just mentioning, you know, working together as a community, I mean, we at the Division of Fish and Wildlife, like she said, we work with a lot of partners. We do research on some of the Westerly Land Trust properties. So we go out there and study wildlife, even though we have, you know, all the other management areas we're studying property, uh, we're studying animals in, it's still important to study them in other places outside of our management areas. And the same thing, like, you know, we as a big organization are talking to other organizations. You as a person should talk to your neighbors, like Mary said, and your friends and you know, if you do have, you know, extra butterfly uh, milkweed, then you can maybe share it with your neighbor and maybe they'll plant it. And if they grow more, maybe they'll share it with their neighbors. So really passing on that message. And if you have something, share it around. <laughs> yeah, you just reminded me, um, actually piggybacking off of something we were talking about earlier too, is uh, so we, uh, my husband and I live in Richmond, Rhode Island, and we have um, a couple acres, but we, uh, decided our front yard is not going to be grass anymore. Um, we have, you know, all kinds of feelings about the turf industry, but <laughs> um, so we have planted a native meadow, native meadow grasses there. Um, and it's taken a couple years to really kind of like build up and, and look actually really beautiful. But our, um, you know, elderly neighbor who's very old school about the presentation of your lawn and everything has been so like, well, that looks awful and da da da. And we're like, well, you know, we don't have to mow it. We don't have to go out there and mow all the time. Um, and so it's taken him a little while, but now he's kind of like, oh, okay, I see the benefits of this. And he's like, well, the, you got so many rabbits in your yard and they're coming into my yard and they're eating my vegetable garden. And we're like, well, uh, you know, and, oh, and he always gets on us about like letting the grass that we do have get too tall. And I'm like, well, you know, we, the reason that they don't eat our vegetables at our house is because we let the grass get tall enough and the clovers bloom and then they eat the clover. Um, so maybe you should do that. And he's like, no, no, no. But I think, you know, over time, the more conversations we have in the more he sees it actually happening, um, the, you know, it's like slowly but surely that change is like starting to come about. So, yeah. That's brilliant. Um, you, may have issues, <laughs> you may have thoughts on the turf industry. I have thoughts on just like mowing in general, like just let it grow. It's, if you're like, if you're mowing over wildflowers and you're just taking away the food, if, you, if you're working in a forest, you see leaf covering. Grass is not the normal state. Um, it's composting leaves and decomposing logs that are putting nutrients back into the soil. So you get more plants. 
Um, so we have about 20 minutes left. So I just want to remind our attendees that if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box. And I um, want to pose this question because I feel like it's, we've been leading up to it basically. So um, basically the question is what are we all working towards? What does an ecological utopia look like to you? What is your end goal? I can start. Um, so I think the biggest thing is just having um, really healthy, intact, large pieces of habitat. And that doesn't mean like one chunk of habitat um, and then those little pieces on the side don't count. Like, like Mary was saying, you know, having your yards that are adjacent to those management areas or any kind of um, conservation land, even those are important. So having unfragmented pieces of habitat, meaning it's not split into pieces, uh, smaller pieces by roads and houses and other development, having this way for animals to move from one piece of habitat to another so they can reach all of those resources that they need. So making sure we have nice, big, healthy habitat that is there for now and for generations to come to make sure that nothing is going to be developed on there, put, put on there and ruin that nice habitat. Yeah, I totally agree with that. My only thing I would add to that is is it, it all habitat. So basically looking from inland forests all the way to the coast so that because you know, all of those habitats have such important benefits and we need to protect them all. And I think one of the you know, one of the biggest challenges is that sometimes the coastal habitats are the hardest ones to protect because of the unfortunately the way at which society looks at coastal property and, and, and values coastal property. Um, those are the areas that are always taxed the highest, um, yet um, have so many benefits, um, you know, from, from the standpoint of, um, from the fisheries, from, um, from storm protection, from habitat and whatnot, it, you know, um, and, 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 I guess from my standpoint, I completely agree with you, Gabby, 100% about that. Like, I, I don't like these fragmented here, 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 here. I'd love to see huge, large tracks and trying to be able to connect everything along there. But I also like to see, see from the standpoint of how do, you know, like going forward. So for instance, um, the Wesley Land Trust has their Winnipeg property that is protecting a salt marsh. And when they decided to protect that, that, that farm area there, um, sometimes it's a hard decision because in, in say a hundred years, it may be completely underwater, but it's providing, it, you know, again, it, providing these, these wetland corridors for salt marshes to actually be able to migrate to these migration corridors, which again are so important for all species, whether it's inland or coastal. So that, that's the only thing I would add to that piece. Yeah, and speaking, I meant to mention this before when you were mentioning that, that site in Nintegrate with a thin layer of the position. That is, I used to uh, work for US Fish and Wildlife Service and I used to study piping plovers and we had shorebirds nesting on there. So tons of shorebirds nesting on there too, not just, you know, uh, marine animals, but also shorebirds are coming and stopping over there. So really important stopover grounds for a lot of animals too. Gabby, I knew that's where I knew you from too. That was the other one, but you're exactly right. And so um, on that whole note, um, we just got an email today from US Fish and Wildlife that plovers are already looking at that that property again so it, you're you're exactly right like it, it's 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 really all creatures you know from you know fish to birds to crabs to you know to, to, to small mammals to to everyone and um and that's the big you know that's a big interconnection piece of all this so yeah i would just say i i agree with all, all of the above um, <laughs> as far as what we should be striving for. Um, and I think it's important to note, you know, that just this idea that like nature has been here, was here long before humans were ever here. And it, you know, once we maybe eventually reach our carrying capacity and die out as a species, like some form of nature is gonna be here after us. Um, so I would say like my ideal environmental utopia is kind of this idea that maybe humans are still here, but we're not really like the apex predator anymore. We're kind of like part of the system and not trying to, you know, be in combat with it so much or trying to, you know, care for it and build it back up. 
like it's already where it should be. And we're just kind of like this little section of it that's like living alongside within it. And to add like maybe a little um, agricultural note in there, I think part of what could help with that or what would be great for that um, is to have more, more and more people getting back into learning how to grow their own food and how to be more self-sufficient in that way. Um, you know, obviously that, that idea is sort of bad for my business, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking ahead, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of years here. Um, having food travel from California all the time just to feed people on the East Coast is, is silly and completely unnecessary. And we do, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, and, you know, all these different kinds of innovative agricultural things like hydroponics and indoor growing and things like that are not, are not necessarily inherently bad, but um, they're not as necessary as we're kind of saying that they are, you know, and they use a ton of resources um, just to grow food that we could just, you know, if everybody had like a little bit of space in their backyard or a community garden plot in the city somewhere or something like that, um, it would just, you know, have that little added knock on effect um, that would kind of create a positive ripple effect for years and years and years down the road. I do think that's one of the positives coming out of the pandemic is I do think a lot of more people are growing their own food or at least moving that direction. I know a lot of people are starting to raise chickens also. Mm -hmm. Another way that it's kind of changing. It's interesting. Yeah, definitely. I've had, um, I've had a lot of folks kind of pick my brain about like how to grow. They're like, how do I do this? <laughs> I'm like, well, <laughs> It takes a lot, but no, um, but seriously, yeah, there are a lot of people that are really interested in it. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword where the pandemic really brought to light how, how terrible the, um, uh, you know, food accessibility issues are actually, they are like that and they have been like that. Um, it just kind of brought it more to light, uh, which, which, which is a good thing that now people can see it and um, people in positions of power can see it and, and start to enact change in that way. But there are a lot more people that want to grow their own food and that's a great thing. Um, right now, specifically like uh, early on is kind of an issue because you know it's causing issues with um, farmers are having a really hard time buying seeds and supplies. Um, and the, the shipping is taking forever, not, not necessarily because the distribution channels are, are backed up because of COVID anymore, but because there are so many home gardeners buying up all of these things. So um, I think, you know, initially it's been a little bit difficult, but overall in the long term, I think it's going to be a really good thing. I'd like to, like jumping off of that, I'd like to, um, before I before I jump off of that, there was a question in the chat and I put it in the, I realized that I clicked answered live instead of typed it. And then I typed it in the chat, the answer, but just in case, <laughs> um, the critter kits, the question was, can the critter kits be accessed um, and utilized by ESL teachers? And the answer is absolutely yes. We would love that. Um, so please feel free to access all the materials, modify them as, as you need to for your students' needs. Um, and definitely, you know, accessing that the Explorer in Spanish um, is, is a great way um, to get that started. Um, we do not have any of the activities per se uh, in Spanish yet, but if that's something that that we get feedback on, we can certainly provide that. Um, but we, we'd love to hear more feedback from ESL teachers uh, because we really, really want to um, reach that community of students as well um, and, and reach the bilingual community. So awesome question. Um, so where was I going with that? Oh, I was going, <laughs> so I, was, I was jumping off of what Cassidy said. Um, I, I like my, my I, I agree with all the, the points that, that Gabby, Dave and, and Cassidy made. I think to kind of add to that, I would love to see more people like embracing a stewardship mindset as opposed to a like, I, have dominion over the earth, you know what I mean? So, so we, you know, as stewards, that doesn't mean that you don't touch anything. You, you certainly, you know, manipulate habitat, you know, whether it's on a farm, you know, you're, you're growing your food. So you can't just, you know, grow food without manipulating the land somehow. Um, whether you're raising, 
you know, animals for meat, whether you're accessing wild game and, and hunting for your food. Um, so that's, you know, that's all, you know, use in some way. Um, but being a good steward means that you're not overusing or that you're, you know, planning it carefully and looking at the big picture. Um, you know, how, how should I be um, harvesting food and game? Uh, how should I be um, even harvesting native plants, you know, <laughs> so people go out and forage, you know, but there's, there's a, a good way to do it and a bad way to do it. You can wipe out, you know, many populations of plants if you take too many. Um, and even just on our, on our own little properties too, that, that stewardship mindset of this little piece of land, you know, that's something I try to think of with my, my little half acre is that this is my little tiny piece of land and I, you know, what I do on it matters. Um, and I wish I had the courage that Cassidy had just like plant a meadow in my front yard. <laughs> if you looked at my neighborhood, you'd be like, oh my gosh, like everybody's got like the nice lawn. It's bad enough that like one side of my lawn is growing in as, as a weed field uh, because of the digging of the sewer line and it never came back as, as grass to match like the rest of the grass. So it, it's like a total like experiment on that side of the yard. But I'm already thinking of ways like, okay, well that grass, you know, I've got really crummy grass on, you know, another side of my yard is that, you know, is it, is it worth it for me to sit there and dump a bunch of weed killer on it and then scrape the ground and put more grass seed and then put more water on it and really try to like revive it? You know, how much money, time and effort and resources am, am I going to waste to get that little tiny patch of grass to look socially acceptable? Whereas I could just create a few more flower beds and add some native plants there and then sprinkle them on the grass and then maybe kind of put some grass seed down and make it look a little bit um, meter, but you know, that's, that's more of like, I, I'm thinking long-term, I, I think, you know, that, 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 that stewardship mindset thinks long-term. So after I leave this house, whether I stay here or move, I'm planting, you know, I said it to my husband, I said, I'm, I'm going crazy with this garden, you know, really trying to improve this little piece of habitat because it's, you know, it's, it's my habitat, we own it, but if somebody else buys this, this house, I'm going to leave that garden, you know, and that, and that, that, you know, I, I said at first, I was like, I got to take my plants with me because they're probably going to rip them all out, you know, but, but you hope that whoever will, you know, take that and say, oh, look at this beautiful garden, they'll leave it. And that's, you effectively, um, you know, impacted, positively impacted that space that you had a hand in, um, you know, forever, you know, or, or hopefully forever, you know, that, that will continue that. So I, I'd like to see more people kind of jump on that bandwagon of like, Oh, our lawn's really that great. Like, oh my God, how many people do you know who like stress over their lawn? You know, like, it's, it's brown in that one patch. What am I going to do? You know, but like a flower bed always looks nice, you know, and just put some mulch down and, you, and, then, and then they'll suppress the weeds. And then your, your perennials grow. Um, so I'm hoping that more people will get on that kind of kick of, of not being so, I got to control everything and more of that, that steward working with nature and being a part of it. Um, and that, that comes with growing your own food and, um, and just being more in tune with, with what's just around you. Um, I think that will really help, you know, the, everywhere, you know, it, it's especially in such an urbanized state, um, you know, like, you know, thinking about infrastructure and green spaces and, and all those things. It's just um, that stewardship mindset will really change things, I think. Um, I get frustrated when I see it in the news that people are like, no, nobody's like, nobody's thinking about it. <laughs> so. On that point, I was gonna say on that point, I totally agree with the stewardship piece. I think that that's such, such an important piece that's all, often overlooked. And I think the other piece that plays in with that too is, is also the education piece. So like, you know, for those, you know, we know that not everyone is going to decide to stop mowing their lawn for whatever reason, but they can get more educated about what type of grass they actually plant there. Kentucky bluegrass, which is in most seed mix, is not, it's not made for around here for our climate. Things like fescues are like tall fescue, red fescue, the URI mix. So just by doing a little bit of research and finding out what actually grows here, again, looking back native, not just native flowers and other plants, but also native grasses too. So if you're gonna do that, you know, we really have to, you have to take a little bit of ownership on your own to, you know, to become better educated about what stuff does grow here, what stuff is going to be best for the environment. Um, and, 
I know I'm going to, do you, Joe, do you want me to transition to that question? Cause I'm sure that that one's pretty good to me. So the question came up is, um, um, are you concerned about the, the dog waste at, um, the dog waste on the beach in Westerly? Um, absolutely. You know, my personal opinion, and I have a dog, so I can say this is that if you have a dog, it's a responsibility and that every single person should pick up after their pet. That being said, every piece of poop that is left on the beach, whether it's from your dog, your cat, if you walk your cat, or, or, even, or even from the birds, you know, historically, I can't, you know, my grandmother used to save the bread, the old bread, so I could feed the birds when I was young. And I didn't know better. I had no idea. I didn't, you know, this is like 35, 40 years ago. I didn't know any better. That's just something you did. But now we know that that has a huge impact on our native population of birds. And, and especially those birds that, that don't migrate anymore because they rely on us. So the same thing is true. Like we, you know, like we shouldn't be, you know, like we should be picking up after our dog. Absolutely. And we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be feeding any wildlife, whether it's a bird, a swan, a goose, a fox, a coyote, a, anything that is supposed to fend for itself in the in in the wild and whatnot and that's a it's a really big concern in terms of what you can do about it um what i always do is is i usually say something to him now i know not everyone will say this but usually if i'm out there walking my dog and they walk by and i say uh, i think you forgot something and they're like oh, oh oh and then they scramble and and so so peer pressure really works I, again, I know it's not for everyone, um, but it's really important that we set the example for everyone else that, again, having a dog is a responsibility. Um, any kind of waste, whether it's, again, dog waste, bird waste, human waste, can make people sick. And, and I say this because um, I've gotten very sick from sewage in the water. You know, I am a, I'm a big surfer. When I used to live over in Newport, I was surfing uh, after a storm in January um, and uh, ended up getting out of the water and was viciously sick for 24 straight hours. And it turns out there was an illegal discharge of human waste into the surf break where I was surfing. So whether it is human waste, dog waste, bird waste, um, in those small areas, they can definitely have a huge impact. There are some places on... Um, even on the Pocketech River and Little Coves, where um, historically there had been some feeding there, and there was um, there was basically bird waste everywhere, and the bacteria numbers that we went out when we go out once a month with DEM were off the charts. I can now say, you know, now that that has ended, it's been about 10 years since that that practice had ended. The water quality is much better. There's not an issue with bacteria in that region. But it's really important that we all work together, that we set the example for everyone else. And if and if we see something like that, the best thing for anything is to speak up and say something. Say, hey, you got to pick that up. I go there. I bring my kids there. They go right. They they swim in that water right there. You need to pick up after your dog. So. Because enforcement's a hard thing, and we all know that, but we can all we can all take the the ownership to be to help enforce that as well. So, okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, I would just want to be be mindful of everyone's time. So, if you all want to take the time to have any wrap up any last minute thoughts or plug your organizations or website, events, social media, um, go ahead. And then I just have one quick question to wrap it up. I'll, um. I just want to mention one one last thing based on what Dave said about feeding wildlife. Um, we do have a really great, um, it's it's within our coyote response guide on our website, and there's a, a an image and it has um, just a backyard. And on that image, you have to try to find what things are attracting wildlife because you might not intentionally be feeding wildlife, but they still might be finding resources in your yard. So things like cat food, um, that you left outside, things like compost piles that are uncovered or have uh, food scraps like fatty um, or meat scraps in them, um, uncovered garbage cans, all of those things can actually attract wildlife to your yard. And also things like raised sheds, animals will den underneath them. So that packet has a really good um, image on it. So you can try to see what you might have in your yard and do a yard audit and see if you can bring in any of those resources because we don't want to unintentionally feed them as well. That's one of the things that's been increasing the coyote population in Newport. So I won't go into that, but I just wanted to, to put that out there. It's a good resource um, if you're worried about attracting wildlife unintentionally into your yard.
Esther, Dave, I think. All right. Um, oh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. We're going to say something. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm from the West Duluth Land Trust. You can find us at westdulandtrust.org or follow our Instagram or Facebook pages. Um, we have a lot of fun, have a lot of fun posts. So follow our work. Definitely get out here in Westerly. Um, thank you again to Amanda for hosting. And just rapid fire, last question. What is your favorite thing about nature or wildlife? Go. Yeah. That's a hard, fast question. There's so many things. <laughs> All of it. I love just being in it. And it's just, it's very calming. I, I just, if I'm stressed, I go put my feet in the ocean or I go sit on a rock in the woods. And it's, it's very calming to me. It's my favorite thing. Yeah, I'm the same way. It doesn't matter where I am in nature. I always find something that I connect onto. Like I, I think I mentioned to you all before when I was up in Maine hearing the call of the loon or, you know, being out surfing in the middle of the water and just listening to the waves, lap a calm, you know, like all those things, you find peace in your own way. And, and that's, you know, that kind of piece is how we connect back to nature itself. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, basically the same thing, like it's so reliable. It's always there for you when you need it. <laughs> um, and there's always something different, you know, wherever you may be, um, you know, different birds chirping, you know, different flowers, different, you know, whatever. So just, uh, I just love to take a, take a breath, <laughs> stop and take a breath. Um, and it's always there when I need it. For me, it's seasonality. I love that, you know, certain things come back, like Gabby and I heard woodcock this week and, you know, in the winter, it's the sea ducks and whether at the end of the summer for me, I love um, Joe pieweed. It's a, it's a native wildflower. And I just love that, you know, those, those annual cycles, when you see these things pop back up, and, oh, oh, the eider are back or whatever it is. It's like seeing an old friend. And I just love those, that, that feeling, that familiarity um, and just being in tune with those seasonal changes is one of my favorite things. Definitely, I like all those sentiments. And my favorite thing is the continuity of nature. These are cycles that have always been around and will always be there. Like a look into the past and the future. Um, so thank you again. Happy Earth Day, everyone. And I will turn it over to Amanda. Do we need to do anything to wrap this up? No, I just want to say thank you guys. Uh, thank you all. I mean, especially um, to Joe for helping to organize this, um, but to Gabby, Dave, Mary, and Cassidy um, for joining us and giving us a little more info about your organizations. And it was, of course, very informative, but I just really appreciate you taking the time um, and happy Earth Day. Thank you for having us on. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Thank you guys. Thank you. Take care. Good night, all.